everyone. Uh, the presentation is on neural movement, leveraging the power of the brain to change transforming clinical outcomes. Um, do we have to do that? No. Okay, so it is well established that the brain can change throughout life. So whereas five or seven years ago that had to be something to be talked about and convince people or inform people, now it's pretty much a standard. A, maybe I'll just say a few words so it gives a little context to this whole presentation. My background is in clinical psychology and um, as, I, as I was uh, going into graduate school, and started doing my clinical psychology. Actually, I did the first year in experimental psychology because I also have a degree in statistics. But when I went into clinical psychology, I realized that the, the verbal venue of trying to impact people's life, while it is very, very important, is also extremely limited. And also having had a, quite a bit of a experience with dance, I was looking for a more movement-based, sensory-based, experiential-based, not just verbal-based approach to trying to impact people's lives. And I was always interested in the brain. At those years, <laughs> when I looked to see, maybe I'll go to medical school, maybe I'll do neurology, I realized that I wouldn't find my answers there. And uh, having studied, um, actually known Dr. Feldenkrais's work uh, since I was three years old because my father brought him to, our, to their living room to experiment with his movement lessons. My father is a scientist. Le uh, then I studied with a ballet teacher that used his work. It came back to me and I started studying with him and then eventually worked with him, traveled with him towards the end of his life when he needed help and then took his work and kept running with it, a, a, a transition from clinical psychology to doing work with people through movement and looking to impact the brain. Another very important element for me in figuring what I've figured out this far is the fact that I've, at a certain point, started working with babies, infants, babies, and young children. And that was extremely compelling. I didn't have any education except the psychology, Piaget, that kind of background about children. I really had to make it up. And because I got outcomes, or the kids got outcomes right away, and pretty dramatic outcomes, parents brought their children to me just because they heard from other parents that they can get some outcomes. So this is the, the, the background. Now, a, the, the, the thing that is a, in this presentation I'm going to talk about is important to remember is that the brain responds to its experience and changes continuously. So there's never a moment that when we interact with another human being and, or when I work with a client or when you work with a client that what we do does not impact the brain. There isn't a break in that. So that means that it's really important for us to try and understand our impact on our client, our student, and I believe in our life in general on each other. So I thought maybe the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to do an exper experiential movement lesson. So you are actually going to move. Uh, but it's going to be short and it's, uh, everybody can do that. If you can stand up, you can do it. So all of you stand up, please, and move your chair into, you know, tuck it under the table because you're going to stand behind your chair and you're going to, that's right, you're going to say, oh, thank you so much for being so, you're ready to move. I like that. Okay, so what you're going to do is I'm going to actually put a video I, that I recorded for a TED, TEDx talk that I did so it can be very efficient. And you're going to understand. It's not a big, it's not a difficult. And let me just start it. Please get up, stand up, turn 30 degrees to your left. Spread your feet comfortably and bend your knees a little bit. And now carefully to, on your head, not to hit it, bend down 
to, with your uh, hands towards your toes, as if you want to touch your toes but do not stretch. And just see how far you go without trying hard and come back. And now turn to face the back of the chair in front of you. Lean on your hands on the back of the chair. And now round your back, round your spine, pull your belly in and lower your head and eyes to look towards your belly button. And then arch your back, push the belly out, and look up with your head towards the ceiling. And now round your back, pull your belly in, and look towards your belly button. And then arch your back, free your abdomen, and look up with your eyes. And now stand up, turn 30 degrees towards your left. So bend your knees a little bit and go down with your hands towards the floor and see if it's become a little easier to go down. And come back up, turn towards the chair, lean on the back of the chair in front of you, spread your legs, bend the knees a little bit and now pull the belly in and look under your left armpit. Turn your head to look, peek under your left armpit and then arch your back and look over your left shoulder. Show your tail, free the belly, and now pull your belly in, and look under your right armpit, and then look over your right shoulder, at your right tush, and now, again, look under your left armpit, round your back, pull your belly in, and then look over your left shoulder, and now stand up, Stand up, turn 30 degrees to your left, bend your knees, spread your feet, and go down and see if it's become even easier to go down and if you're going even further. Excellent. And stand up and sit down. <laughs> Isn't it fun to move? Yay. So... <laughs> So what just happened? Your brain changed. Your brain can change in a positive, in quotes, or in negative direction. So very often now when people talk about brain plasticity or brain change, the assumption is that the change is going to be a positive change. And it's actually important to know the brain has no judgment. The brain is going to respond to its experience and the conditions which it has internally and externally. Of course, Martha, uh, Dr. Herbert spoke about that ex extensively in terms of the internal conditions. Uh, so it's important again to know, and the lecture uh, about the eyes and the vision also implied that we could do things to actually deteriorate the, the people's the people we work with depends what we do with them or the conditions in general. So we can look at the arc of life and the traditional and still I believe for most people there is a very intense period of growth, vitality, learning, acquisition of skill and then there is a plateau that is, has whatever length it has for people and then usually gradual and then accelerating the deterioration of function and deterioration in brain, in brain function, brain activity. My experience from my understanding, and I'm sure for many people in this room and what I've already heard today, which is fascinating, uh, the arc of life can actually look more the way we look right now. So my father, who's taken my training program two times, that's a pretty extensive process, and has been doing this work for a long time, is going to turn 96 years old, and he's on his third startup. The last one, he does it with my brother two years ago. He's an inventor, he's a chemist, biochemist. And he just is, is flown, is flying today, I don't know the time change, from uh, Switzerland back to Israel. He lives in Jerusalem, and he took a week on his own because he wanted to detach and contemplate. And he goes to Switzerland to a place where he can take hikes in the woods, right? He has his favorite place. So he definitely does this curve. He's a sample of one, but we can always start somewhere. So, uh, so let's look at the uh, two kinds of uh, brain plasticity. And 
uh, the two kinds, the, the first plasticity and the one that we look to evoke, or I look to evoke when I work with a, a clients, is the a plasticity of the new. That means new connections, creation, invention, taking risks. There's a lot of risk in change for the organism. Breakthroughs, new possibilities, transformation, and increased vitality. And the other kind of plasticity is, again, I'm sure I'm talking to stuff that some of you know very, very well, if not all of you, but I am just going to go through it quickly, is Hebbian plasticity, which is also extremely important. So habits have gotten a really bad rap, but if we stop for a second and we think what will happen if we wake up tomorrow morning and we would lose our habits, or many, too many of them, it would be very sad. So our ability to just get up, walk around, brush our teeth, put our clothes, figure out, oh, I've got to do this, get into our car, or whatever it is that we do, is extremely important. So the uh, automatization of our functioning is extremely valuable. And there is, a, 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 during the learning process, certain parts of the brain are more active. And as it gets automatic, actually, other parts take over to a great extent. Now, at the same time, there's a big risk with habits. And it's very, very important to understand in terms of recovery, in terms of acquisition of function, improvement of function, and rehabilitation. Uh, so, Hebbian plasticity is formation of habits, it's repetition, it's automat uh, automaticity and reliability, it's sameness, it's risk of being stuck, it's survival, and it could be gradual loss of vitality. And that occurs when the balance in, terms of, in the brain, in terms of its readiness to do the new versus its ability, versus its real, real, uh, reliance on habits, gets too heavily weighted towards the habitual. That's when all, a lot of uh, negative things I find, pain, loss of the flexibility, um, and then also in terms of rehab are very important. So I've already said that. So what we, I would like to speak today, what I'll be focusing quite a bit, is tools for practical applications of brain plasticity principles based in neuroscience. That means when we, when we want to drive positive brain change, how can we do it? So now that we know it's possible, how can we do it? Is doing a, you know, 20 a, a word, um, how do you call those? Crossword, right? Crossword puzzles. Is that going to get me the best brain I can have? Or what can I do? And, are the, and what, you're going to, what I'm going to present to you are going to be not so much content-based what to do, but process-based what to do. That means principles that you can bring into pretty much any activity, and that will wake up the brain and will wake up more the processes of change, of learning. But first, what is the job of the brain? So if we look at the heart, it has a job, eyes, everything in our, in our body, every system in our body has a job. The question is, what's the job of the brain? Now, you know, again, Dr. Herbert Martha has spoken about it in, in, in the metabolic level and all that. When we look, want to look at an overview, what's the job of the brain? Because if, you wanna, if we want the brain to function better, we might as well know what we want it to do. And the job of the brain is to put order in the disorder and to make sense out of the nonsense. So, for instance, working with a child on the autism spectrum, working with children on the spectrum, one of the ways to look at, what, at their condition is that they have a terribly hard time putting order in the disorder and making sense out of the nonsense. Because until the brain does it, it's nonsense, it's noise, it's stimulation. But it's so that the ability of the brain to do that, to do its job, is actually can fluctuate enormously, definitely between people, but also within the same person. So if tonight you're going to drink too much, your brain is going to degrade in its ability for at least a little while to put order in the disorder and make sense out of the nonsense. To continue, I have realized over the years that 
a very important distinction that needs to be made is the distinction between a mechanical system and information system. So when we try to influence the brain, so for instance, a child that cannot talk. So I'm thinking of specifically right now in my, in my, in my own mind that uh, uh, had uh, uh, cerebellar hypoplasia and other you know, defects in the brain and uh, took five years, uh, six years to get her but to, to walk and do all kinds of things. She's doing very well, understands very well, couldn't talk, she's aphasic. Every time she wanted to produce sound, let alone speech, she just did the opposite action and got stuck, right? So how do we try to help her? Uh, at that point, they didn't live uh, they don't live too far away, they live in South Bay in California, but she went into school, the school system and all stuff, they started speech therapy. I was very concerned about that because I, I know that fundamentally, implicitly, the, the, the most speech therapy approaches it from a mechanical model. What's a mechanical model? That's the model we first knew ourselves and is most familiar. If I'm going to exert force on this, it's going to topple over or move or, excuse me, or shake or something like that. As babies, as children, we have blocks. I mean, this is how we know. This is our mechanical self, right? Of course, it's not a, a it's alive, but it's a mechanical system. We try to influence something like speech, for instance, for a child where the therapist actually tries to exert force, try to make the brain do the thing it's not doing somehow through a mechanical intervention or anything as close to it. So I got an email that said, said, the mother said, she has a very nice speech therapist, it's going really well, she's not talking, which for me was a question mark, and then she said, but the therapist says that her facial muscles are too weak. So if they were stronger, she would talk. Could you give her some sessions to strengthen her face muscles? I emailed the mother back. We're in a very good relationship. Uh, the girl has come to life through our work with her. And I said to her, so sorry, I'm not a muscle specialist. I work with the brain. So she emailed back and said, so, so very sorry. <laughs> because from my point of view, the muscles in her, the girl's face are plenty strong. There's no problem there. And if they're weak, it means that the mapping of the muscles in the brain is not sufficient. The brain is not recognizing those muscles. And there are ways to work with that for sure. But the reason she didn't talk is the brain was doing something completely, excuse my language, kakamemi, that stopped her from being able to talk. Now, when you try to tell a child to talk, and that's just to loop it back to the whole question of habits, we learn our experience. When I wrote my book, Kids Beyond Limits, my very wonderful editor wrote me back and said, I think or not you made a mistake. You meant to say we learn from our experience. I emailed her back. I said, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> so what happened is the girl learned to not talk because she associated the intention of talking with the actual reaction that her system produced. So it got less and less likely she was going to talk. Now, I'm not going to go and tell to you what I did with her, but she's talking. But it might be the story in uh, um, Norman Doidge's new book. You know the guy who wrote The Brain That Changes Itself? I recommend this book. He's coming with a new book, and he was there. What anyway? I think it's he wouldn't tell me, but maybe it's in the book. So, the brain is an extremely large. So it's a, not a mechanical system. It's an extremely large, dynamic, non-linear. It's a mouthful. Self-organized system, which basically says it's an information system. These things are in self-organizing and system is an information system. So w the question is, what's the source of information? Is it stimulation? Most people would say yes. I, again, from my experience, I realized that stimulation in its own right isn't, does not have informational value. And I actually a, a, realized that working with children on this, uh, in a, also somewhat um, people with stroke, adults with stroke, but with children, because children, uh, uh, 
a lot of times trying to get kids with a spastic cerebral palsy, they are asked to do and to try harder. And I observed that when they, that happens, they get more and more spastic because there isn't sufficient differentiation in the brain, there isn't enough uh, insulation, and the stimulation, rather than get them to be able to control and refine movement more, actually makes it worse and worse. So stimulation is absolutely important, it's a necessary thing, but it is not enough. What turns stimulation into information is the perception of a difference. And I'm going to say it, it's so simple, it's embarrassing almost, but that's what I've, it has come down for me to understand what it is about what I do that works. Because what, I, I became very effective very quickly. I, I just was lucky. But then I kept asking, what is it about what I do that works? And I asked it for 15 years. I'm still asking it all the time. But one of the things that I've come to is that it's the perception of a difference because I observed adults, I worked a lot with musicians, I worked with top musicians in the world, I worked with dancers a lot, that was my world, I worked with some athletes, and I realized that when people are lacking ability, it's when they don't notice that something is going on. They have no information. So information equals the perception of a difference. So let me show you a video of a four and a half year old a, a, on the spectrum needed potty training. He, he did go to the bathroom for, a, the, for pooping. I don't know if it's number one or number two, I always forget. But he peed, he peed, I tried to say it the nice way, but I figured I can't. Uh, it, but it, he, he, he kept peeing in his pants. And I'll, I, you'll hear it also on the video, but, and he, I thought, what is it? So first of all, he was a very willful little kid. He was doing a lot better, stopped banging his head, started looking their eyes, you know, all those things were improving. But he wasn't, he wasn't, they weren't able to uh, toilet uh, train him. And I thought part of it is might be he just doesn't want to bother. You know, so many kids when they're little, when they get busy playing and stuff, they would just pee in their pants and just take care of it later or have the parents take care of it or whatnot. But the other thought, I thought, does he feel it? Now, he's, he was wearing uh, diapers. They absorb the, the, the um, fluids. The weight changes, but not the, he doesn't feel the wetness. So I didn't know if that's the case or not. I got permission from the mom to do what you'll see. I took a, 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 a small like face towels. And I had a little bowl with the lukewarm water. And one was wet and one was dry. And you'll see in just a few minutes what happened with Spencer. OK, so now I'm going to touch your leg, but you're not going to look and one towel with those t little towels. And one towel is dry and one towel is wet. And you tell me either if you know or if you guess whether it's, this one is dry or wet. What do you think? Wet. It's and false. this one, what do you think? Is it dry or wet? Dry. You got it, you reversed mm -hmm. it. So now. This one, is it dry or wet? Wet. I'm on his face. And this one, is it dry or wet? You got those ones right. Dry. Okay. And now, is this one wet or dry? Dry. And this one, is it wet? Wet. Wet. And this one, is it wet or dry? Wet. Right. And this one, is it dry or wet? What? Dry. I'm doing the same one again. Is it dry or wet? What do you think? Dry. Okay. Now I'm going to do it on your back. Okay? So now, <clears throat> this one. Is it wet? Wet. Okay. So this up, one. Is it wet or dry? Wet. Okay. And this one. Is it 
Wet or dry? Wet. And dry for the bottom. That's right. That's and this right, one because is I touched dry. it to both ends of the towel. Oh, I didn't know it. Yeah, so now he's doing better than me. Dry. He is. Okay. And this one, is it wet or wet. dry? Hoppa. And this one, is it dry or wet? Wet. Being dry. Okay. I'm going to do it a little bit on your tush. Just at the top of your tush, okay? Here we go. So this one, oops, here we go. Is it wet or dry? Wet. And this one, is it wet or dry? Wet. And is it dry or wet? Dry. Is it dry or wet? Dry. Okay, you have perfect identification. What he needs, he needs to wear pants and feel when it's wet and dry because I, I just occurred to him as I'm doing it. Those chemicalized things, they absorb all the wetness so you don't feel it. They're designed to not be felt. The only thing you can feel is the weight of it, the bulk, the volume. Is she dry? Your pants dry? Yeah, but you're wearing a diaper and your diaper, when it gets wet, the, the pee goes right through it so you don't feel whether it's wet or dry. He simply needs to feel when he pees in his pants. So he should wear underwear. Underwear. Normal kid underwear. No, no underwear. Well. Not put it. No, you're getting. If you're out of diapers. You're not going to wear diapers and you're nope. not. No. That's a good thing. But that's if we're in diapers. Let me tell you what's a good thing. It's a good thing for you to feel when you start peeing in your pants because you'll feel the wet right away and you know what you'll do? What? You'll run to the bathroom and finish peeing oh, in the bathroom. He never wet his pants after this session. That was it. It was over. What did we do here? The perception of difference. He didn't, for whatever reason. He, and you see, when I touched him with a towel uh, on his legs, the first one, it was false. He, he made a mistake. The second one, he made a mistake. Then I realized there's no point in continuing doing it on his legs because he does not have the sensitivity at this moment to perceive the difference. So I don't want to train him into doing all what, where he's at. I want to progress it. So I went to the face. I went to the face because the face is much more innervated and built to be more sensitive to what we feel in terms of our skin, wet, dry, hot, cold, and so on. So and I did it close to the mouth, which is, of course, the, one of the most sensitive areas in the body. So he identified it around the mouth. He could identify it. He eats, he drinks, he figured that one out. So once he identified it here, then I went to, uh, back to his legs. Because from my experience, I know how quickly the brain translates learning from one area to another, from one system, from vision to hearing, and so on. It's basically upgrading the brain's ability to do that task. So he did it. And then you could see it got faster. The first time I identified it correctly, it was the slowest response. And then it got faster and faster and faster. And it's just a few minutes. It's amazing the speed of the change. And it's just an example. And it's such a exa clear example of perception of differences that I decided to bring it here. Now, he didn't want to change. But that's where he's four and a half years old. And he doesn't get to say that. And he had the, he had the, 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 no, he could perceive it. So that was it. He could do it and he was compelled to do it. Like everyone here in the room, all of us, believe it or not, I, even for me, we were toilet trained way back. And we learned it. Uh, pretty much everybody learns it, right? So, what, uh, just a couple of people, what, what do you think you're looking at? Say something. You can't fail because it's not defined, yeah. What? Rectangles. You see rectangles. Excellent. Somebody else. Lego. 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 Perfect. Anybody else wanting to say something? No. You're not used to doing that in the, what? You see a dog. Good for you. Excellent. What is this? You can say a mess. You can say anything. What? More rectangles. No. Square. <laughs> Square. <laughs> Squares. Okay. What? What? Anybody? 
9-11. 9-11. Oh, that's sad. Ooh. Ugh. Okay, that's what you see. What do you see here? Easy. What do you see here? Okay. The reason I do, I call it the DAC, I actually do a full lecture on that. But that is a, 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 a visual, the easy, I think relatively easy uh, um, a visual representation of the process of differentiation integration and of the process of how, in a, of course, dynamic, multidimensional uh, process happens in our brain. So when we start, when we don't know something, we always have to start where it's not there. If something's gonna be created, it's not there. Through perception of differences, actually the process of differentiation happens and literal growth of connections between cells and so on occurs. And as we differentiate, so if you think of a young child, and that's a, a newborn baby, they have primarily random movements. They have a, also a reflex movement and random movement. They don't have organized intentional movement yet. That random movement is the basis for the future controlled movement. And, and when that movement is denied, either I had one kid I write about in my book that was put up in full body cast because he had what the doctor described dislocatable hip joints. So it was a mechanical and imposed reduction of the, those random movements, he couldn't figure out how to move. Perfectly healthy baby, the brain didn't get enough of that information and those perception of differences and experiences to, to work with. So spastic cerebral palsy or the other kind of cerebral palsy reduces a lot the movement. That's actually in my world, children with cerebral palsy mostly don't move because they don't get the experience of random and a lot of variability of movement and the brain can't figure it out. So it's not like we have a switch in our brain that at a certain age something got switched on and then we know how to do a movement. It's this, this massive, enormous amounts of a, a, a differentiation in neural networks from which we carve out, integrate, that's another way of saying it, integrate specific movements, specific actions, specific skills, and then we can keep that process. If we keep it open, we don't just over, a, a, automatize it too soon. So this is the, the, the process through which, and maybe Neil can talk about, are you up to talking about that? A, a minute about this research of the power of perception of differences for the, as a source of information for the brain to reorganize and change us in so many ways. In this case, it's pain. Pain reduction, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm Neil Sharp, I'm from the UK. I trained initially as a, an MD and then got to this point in my career through a very logical progression of leaving medicine to become an opera singer. And then uh, I discovered a nut 10 years ago, felt her work in my own body as a result of you know, work I was doing for my singing, but realized there was something to do with my brain that my medical training hadn't prepared me for. And I was so curious, I had to come out here to the States to study with her. And for me, the very exciting thing has been she's, she, only speaks from her experience. I realized that very early on in my training. So I had a great confidence in what she was teaching. And I saw the results she was getting, which were beyond what I thought was possible. And in that intervening 20 years from my leaving medical school to finding her, a lot happened in, in our understanding of the brain. There's a long way we still have to go. But I realized that, you know, once I started to sort of have a clear idea of what she was doing, that actually neuroscience was beginning to catch up with what she and people like her have been doing through their own experience, through working with people. So she came to write her books and she said, you know, Neil, this is what I believe. Can you go out there and find out if anybody else has been like working in this field and has, has done any research that backs it up? And very quickly, we, very excitingly, we began to find a lot. And this one is, a, we found it recently, obviously it's sort of five, six years old now. But this feeds into her belief that when there is pain, one of the things that happens is a lack, you know, we lose differentiation in the area of the pain. And our theory for creating differentiation 
is through this process of perception of differences. So this research is, is done with people with something called uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, also known as chronic re regional pain syndrome, which is a very debilitating illness and very difficult to treat. And what they did with these, uh, these people is they took their arm, they did it on the arm, and they did a test where they asked them to perceive the difference whether they were being touched by a cork, like a wine bottle cork, or the top of a pen. They did this over a period of weeks, and there was a marked um, decrease in the perception of pain and a marked decrease in the level of disability. They were able to function much better. The control group were touched in exactly the same way but were not asked to see if they perceived a difference. They were just touched. And in those, there was no change in the, uh, in the outcome. They had the same level of pain and same level of disability at the start. So that we were very th thrilled when we found this because it really speaks to what we believe. Yeah, yeah they, they, the first place where I personally got connected between, I, I asked Neil, I said, have they already found out that that's how it's working? <laughs> this was, uh, he's, he made it a little more modest. Uh, but the thing is, uh, Dr. Michael Merzen got asked to read my, the manuscript of my first book, then asked to meet with me and talk. And when I told him about this, my thinking about random movement and infants and all that stuff, he said, that's what I tell everybody, it has to be randomized movement and so on. In the meanwhile, you know, we, we've developed a friendship, we do some professional collaboration some re in the process of doing some research. So discrimination, differentiation, and sp spontaneous integration. That means we first of all have to, to discriminate, meaning I'll give you an example. So babies, uh, when they're infants, again, they, there's the, the, the hand flexes. There's a lot of, you know, the flexion system part of the brain is active. The extension is taking about four months usually to really start kicking in. But they, a healthy infant will flex their hand when they're awake, when they're alert, when there's some excitability, the hand will be flexed. And then it opens and then it flexes. So one can assume, or I assume, that the child actually does not know that they have a hand. It's not me yet, it's not part of me. It's through the movement, it's through the sensations and through the outcomes that my actions produce and then the predictability of the outcome that I actually build my own sense of self, my image of self, my feeling of self, my identity of self. And what happens is that at a certain point and it must be probably, I would presume, through some random, again, movements where the index fingers move relative to other fingers, and the child recognizes it, that there is this versus the rest of it. I call it thing one, thing two. We have to have thing one, thing two. That's when we can start doing something. Wet, dry, this versus that. And then they go, you know, they have this age where they just become little Napoleons like that. And then gradually, and some people learn to differentiate their fingers a lot more. Chiropractors use their hands, there's a lot more sensitivity. People who just do very basic stuff, what well, they're mapping in the brain is completely different. Same thing, ballerina, the feet. Our brain maps in relation to the use and experiences and degree of differentiation. Very, I know integration is very important, but before integration, there has to be differentiation. Actually, integration always happens, but the question is what do you integrate? And how soon do you want to integrate and call it quits, right? I've arrived. And I, in my work with the people all these years, I found that most difficulties that I have worked with, not always, but most difficulties could at least get better if I set the person, open the door, and set them again on the process of further differentiation in the area and context of where there is suffering or limitation, both on the emotional level, physical level, and cognitive level. I work a lot with the kids, you know, that come to me, of course, they have difficulty reading, writing, math, all that kind of stuff. Always a question of differentiation, and one of the things that we put, if you could, do we have it in there? I hope so. So ways to reliably and predictably improve function. Yeah, here we go, I, I, I have it. As I started working, and especially it's the children, between the high performers and the kids with limitation, it kind of like was an interesting thing that I got to discover stuff. I couldn't figure out how anybody would ask a child that cannot crawl to crawl. 
In my world, it doesn't make sense. Because if he could, he would. If she could, she would. There needs to be something that's preliminary to the crawling that all children do, all children's brains and systems do, that gets them to spontaneously start crawling. If a child is not crawling for whatever reason, they are not able to do it. If I ask them to do what they can't, I am training them into their limitations. So there might be some degree of improvement, but in the improvement is built in a ceiling for the rest of their lives. Because once the brain gets habituated into it, it's much harder to do anything about it. And I want to make it here, you guys are all into rehab and working with brain, the TBI and all that stuff. I'll take the example of stroke patients. My understanding uh, of the process of rehab of stroke is such that I believe that while the initial cause for the devastation is the stroke, the level, the limitation of the, the uh, degree of improvement is due to the intervention. So I don't know if you know that, you probably do, that most people have had your garden variety stroke, within four to five weeks, do not really improve much anymore. Is that familiar to you guys? Are you aware of that? Is that your awareness of that? I worked with a, a, a man, 48 years old, I knew him, he helped build our center, so I knew him, and he had massive stroke, both sides, uh, you know, uh, prefrontal cortex, devastated on all the machine, breathing machine, the whole thing. I won't go into details, but we were allowed to go in and start working with him. We did 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon for 10 days. He was in the ICU and he was under proper fault, so because he was a big guy and he had all those jerky movements and they were afraid they didn't want him to move. And and we, we worked uh, on him not to get him to do anything, but to not let the brain settle, because the brain changes in such a speed that in no time it reorganizes itself into cur its current condition. After 10 days of work, they took him off all the different things, and he woke up, and he sat up, and he walked to the bathroom by, by himself. And the neurologist said it's one in a million, and I said no, it is zero in a million, because if you don't do this again, it will never happen again. I befriended since, uh, she read my book, she called me up, I befriended Jill Balti Taylor. She called me up, she said she read the children's book, she said, Anat, you defined and organized what my mother and I did for me. So, you know, she became a big, a big fan. So she's a unique example of somebody who her mother, who's a mathematician, protected her and had used her intuition what to do with her daughter, let her sleep a lot, which was very important, and so on. So if he could, he would. If she could, she would. So let's not, my, I really say to people, and I'm very, very, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pushy teacher. I want, I look for, I see great possibility for people. So it's not like, oh, don't do anything, they're not going to get better, but don't ask people to do what they can't. So instead, drive positive brain change, how? So this is where we talk about the how. There are not, I define nine essentials, practical tools to, for driving, for waking up the brain and getting the brain to do its own job better. And I will go into the first one. The first one I call movement with attention. So, Einstein said, nothing happens until something moves. The best way to drive change, and all of you use that, is movement. Without movement, there's anything. My teacher, Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais, said movement is life. Without movement, life is unthinkable. He was a physicist, and that is what I call it, is movement is the language of the brain. When we use movement, and in a minute I'll say other essentials, with the other essentials, we really communicate with the brain. We really connect to the other person, and we, we, we facilitate for the person to start doing their own growth and reorganization. Daniel Walpert, and if you haven't seen his uh, 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 TED talk, uh, he's from Cambridge. Uh, I recommend to look at it. He says that the only reason we have a brain is because we move. Once you take movement away, the brain is unnecessary. 
And I think it's a, he's fun and he's very adamant about his ideas. And I, I like it. So now let me show you a video before we go into the nine essentials of a 21 month old baby child. He's not, I don't know, toddler. A, he was just diagnosed the week before as having autism. I was the first person to interact with him afterwards. He's, just so you understand some of the sounds you'll hear, his twin brother is there. And his twin brother is much stronger, by the way, he snatches his toys, pushes him over, and so on. You will notice it anyway, no question about it, but I just want to say the father was holding him standing in the beginning. Most of the sounds actually come from the brother, from the twin. But the father was hold, holding uh, uh, Jonathan, and he was just arching, you know, that involuntary arch, back, violent arching, and it was like a cycle in the brain, just arching, arching, arching. I want you to see what kind of change is possible, and then we'll go into the essentials quickly. Is that where I push? Oh, no, I have to do it. to click it to the next slide. Oh, I have to click it to the next slide. That's fine. Okay. Here, uh, where is it? Here we go. Okay, I have, I don't know that it's a problem or not a problem, I can't say for sure, but what I can say, Just a few minutes later, so first he, he's arching, and what I do is I impose, sort of, I, I, he's just doing it, he's been doing it forever, right? But he, because of the way he's sitting, I just say, you're going to look at your dad, you're going to come back. You're going to look, because he's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. He's not trying to look at his dad, but I'm giving it, so I'm actually putting an intent, an order, around his involuntary action with the hope, or we'll see if he grabs onto it. He either will or won't. But then, in, the, in what I do, by the way, is he arches, I help him. If you could see, I don't try to inhibit the action. I actually have my hands. So the first time I follow him, and then I get to feel that he's, a, you can feel that he's about to start. There's a, just the initial contraction. I actually go a, a, a nanosecond ahead of him. Again, so instead of it being a reflex, involuntary thing, all of a sudden he's following my guidance. As I'm saying it with my words. And you'll see that within no time he just stops doing it and he didn't do it anymore at all. That's the speed of the change in this research actually from Israel, from Jerusalem University, that shows it's almost instantaneous. Those synapses form almost on the spot. So, I, um, so I just wanted to say, oh, and I'm working on the ankles, and I say, I've seen it with most of the kids on the autism spectrum. I find it's remarkable that they can stand and walk. I think they're geniuses, because they have such reduced level of differentiation in their actual movement. The brain is actually having, that, that's part of how to understand the, the condition. So when they walk, the ankles has to, have to rigidify to keep them up because they don't have the freedom, they don't allow themselves the complexity of self-correction and the speed that otherwise would be necessary. So I, I go into those, ang anyway, so that's a, just to explain to you a little bit because you're, most of you, I believe, are practitioners, so you have some idea of what it is. Ah, ah, Ken, 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 Ken,
That's good enough. Um, the whole thing is gone? Wait, we'll get okay, back. I'll talk in the meanwhile. So... And Jonathan did not have contact with his eyes and uh, when we called him he never came. He didn't respond to us. And now he's a completely different kid. He's uh, he, he, he really here, here. He can fight too now. He can fight here. Yes. Before he couldn't fight his brother. Now he can fight. That's good. <laughs> yeah. And he eats better. He responds to what we have to say. And uh, when we call him, he come. <laughs> great eye contact, um, which he didn't have almost at all. We couldn't really reach his eyes, and uh, uh, he eats a lot better. Before, he used to come with the food to his mouth, no way. He would turn his head, and and now uh, one more thing is that uh, he he can play with other kids, which is something that uh, uh, we didn't get to have before. So big improvement, and, uh, talking a lot more. Expressing in words. Words. words, yes. Thank you, and stuff like that more. Yeah. All right, I, I'm going to stop because we, we, why is, oh yeah, now it's moving. Uh, so, the, the, this was, I gave him that one session, then he got three, in the following two weeks, three sessions and three sessions, and that's when I saw them again. So that you see, after two weeks, and a, either a total of six or a total of seven, I'm not sure. So, um, I think it's, for me it's important to see how she describes all this uh, range of improvements with a child, many of which we did not focus on or expect, knew to expect to improve, including, and that's where you know, I, I talked to Martha about that, he eats better, he digests better, he can interact with people, his brain can do its job better. And, and if, again, from the talk before about the eye and, and how that he, he can, you, in, my, in my world there was a moment in the session where he looked at me and he smiled and he looked, first of all he looked at the ankle, looked at me, looked at the hand, he was able to make sense, to get what was going on and happening for him and when we do that and the better we can do it the better we feel. We are built to put order in the disorder. We are built to make sense of our world. So the more we can drive that experience, both in adults, in children, I work with people who are aging, the transformations can be remarkable the moment they have more that ability to do that process, that underlying process. So it has been through research estimated that when the brain is in a learning mode in children, I believe in adults it's about equivalent just because of the rate of observed change in them, is 1.8 new, 1.8 million new connections per second, about 100 million a minute. The brain works in large numbers. So, what? Yeah, I, okay, thank you. So we're going to skip the phantom pain 
research, but phantom pain limb, again, when people learn to remap and, and differentiate in relation to a, a prosthesis, the pain goes away. I've done it in Israel, actually, with some people in, you know, from the army and all that stuff, without the prosthesis. You can redifferentiate around the new, literally new body, because you have a body without an arm or without a leg, or if you have a stroke, it's a new body, it's a new brain, it needs to be re-patterned, re-learned, re, uh, reinvented. So we're talking about essentials, so movement with attention. The attention part is that movement without attention drives heavy and plasticity. That means it drives more deeply the existing patterns. So if we have a habit that we want, we like it, like an athlete, and they've arrived at doing something the way they want to, then to gradually increase the speed and increase the repetitions is a ter terrific idea. But if we are not where we want to be, or we are where we don't want to be, then repetitions and speed are not a good idea. And what drives change, movement is essential, it's necessary, is attention. Merzenich, Michael Merzenich, has a very elegant research, it's quoted here, that movement without attention, no observable increase in density in the mapping of the brain in that area that is, is uh, uh, it, uh, moving, and movement with attention, very rapid changes. Again, I gave you the 1.8 million estimate. Slow is uh, the second essential. So first of all, if we work with people, we want them to learn, we want the brain to wake up, we move them, we can either ask them to move or we move them, we do it in a way that calls their attention to what they feel as they move. So it's not so much instruction, make sure your hand is there. And maybe it's, you can tell, do a certain movement, but then the focus is what do you feel? What do you feel in your pelvis? What do you feel in your ankle? What do you feel? And it doesn't have to be, it does, I found out it's, it almost doesn't matter where you ask them to feel as long as you ask them to feel. As you get more experience when I train people, then you also can guide that part a little bit more. But movement without attention, if we want change, is not a good idea. Slow is the second essential. Again, because of the structure, because how the brain works, fast we can only do what we already know. Fast is good, fast is important. We want a brain that can go fast, can do things fast, but if we go fast, we default to what's already there. We default to more deeply grooved in patterns. We don't do something completely new when we go really fast. That's one of the big mistakes in, where's the lady with education in schools, where, where they ask kids, in, I, when my daughter was in the second grade, I think first or second grade, and they, they used to time them on a lot of simple, you know, they asked them to do in 20 minutes a hundred little, like, you know, addition or subtraction. And I, I went to the school and I said, that's what you have computers for. I want her to think math. I don't want her to do little stupid computations fast. I want her to have the time to think. Once she understands math or the basic stuff, the brain does it fast. But what's valuable is that the mathematical thinking is not the speed. We have computers. Then speed gets also useful. So when we want, I work a lot, to, and by the way, that movement lesson that you did, you. I got you to move, a few movements, you felt, you do this, you do that, and the change happens. Slow, very powerful tool, enormous. Sometimes only slowing down the action, it starts transforming. And if you pay attention to what you feel, it goes even faster, and we will keep going. Subtlety is the reduction of force. We are talking about perception of differences. Movement with attention is perception of differences. Slow allows for perception of differences. Gives the time. Subtlety, that's the reduction of force. The Weber-Fechner law, the more intensity there is to the stimulation, the more added stimulation we need in order to perceive a difference. Right, so we dim the light for you to be able to see this better. We put up the light, you can't see this so well. You can say a, a noise to stimulus ratio, any way you want to talk about it. When we reduce the force in the joints, in the muscles, emotional force, mental force, like you've got to understand it, or you've got to give me the right answer, or stuff like that, 
we reduce the ability of the system to notice differences and to gather information with which to problem solve. So going gently, going slowly, paying attention to what we feel, that is incredibly potent, really incredibly potent. You saw me doing it with little Jonathan. That's what I did with him. In 10 minutes, the lesson was over. I mean, there was nothing he could learn more in those 10 minutes. It was so much change. The next one is variations. Variations is intentional introduction of differences. So again, usually people are taught to do things the right way. So people are taught to play the violin, hold it like this, hold it. No, no, that's the right way. The most, uh, the least potency of use of the brain. Because the brain needs and thrives with variability. It's built, it generates variability. The body, the brain, everything generates variability all the time. And for learning, we need a lot of variations. Healthy children play a lot. Play is variability. So when you take adults, when you take somebody who had a stroke, people say, stand up, hold here, now try to move the leg, no, do, 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 do. stand straight, stand straight. I, first of all, I take people away from the upright position. I put them lying down, get, give the brain a break. Get it. We learn to stand up lying down anyway. You know, that's what we do. We lie down and we learn to stand up lying down. So you take away the demands of organizing the, in the gravitational field to begin with, but then it's variability. You do it like that and you do more like what you're already doing and do it a little bit more. Now do it a little less. If you want somebody to get straighter, get them bent more than they know what straighter means. We need to perceive differences. Variations are very, very powerful. I use them a lot with the musicians and dancers. Very, very powerful to drive change. I'm not going to do that with you. No time for that. The next one, the next essential flexible goals. So somebody comes, we know where they, they know where they want to go. The parents know where they want them to go. I know where I want them to go. But I have to really have a relationship to the goal where I can throw the goal way into the future and allow the process to happen, allow the richness of the information. Remember, the brain is an information system. It has to do with managing the expectations of the client. And it's also very much a form of internal, I don't know, we have to upgrade ourselves. We can't get attached to an outcome right here, right now. Because the system has enormous amount of possibility, but if we narrow down that we have to get the outcome now, very often we can't get to it. Because we sh shortcut the, the richness of the process that's required to get there. The first child I worked with took nine years to get her to stand and walk, I mean to stand much sooner, but to walk independently. Also um, cerebellar hypoplasia. Anyway, done. Next one, enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is, is, from my world, is a quiet thing, but it's the willingness and the ability to amplify internally changes. So instead of looking to make a big change, to, to see if we think of the brain as a quantum system, there isn't a small change and a big change, there's only a change. So if I observe a change, it g tells me that something is going on. It can be the finest change, I know, okay, I've got that brain going. So I do another thing, I got a response, I've got that brain full going. I can see if the response is positive, negative, I can adjust myself. So it's a very dynamic process between me and my clients or the groups that I work with. But the enthusiasm, and I train people I work with and I train parents to, because I found that when the parent sits in the room and the child does something new that would be uh, socially considered small and they internally get delighted about it, the brain of the child gets it better. It's like, the, and without words, and now there's research that shows that that's the case, that the emotional communication happens and impacts the myelinization in the brain. The next one is the learning switch. We're either in a learning mode or not. It's known from the way the brain works, with the biochemistry of the brain, and you learn to see. If, so just very simple examples. If somebody is really tired, I'm not going to try and get them to do something new. If a child is scared because the mother left the room, I'll bring the mother into the room because that brain is too busy feeling like it's about to die and it's in danger. So we want to create conditions, and of course that's where so much what Martha talked about is so relevant. Because sometimes we work with kids, that's how I got more and more interested in that aspect. In four minutes, they get depleted. They're very responsive, and then they get blacks under the eyes and say, okay, 
They just, there's something they need there, you know, nutritionally, I have no idea, it's not my expertise. So I started looking for people that could help me and help the kids. And of course, there's more and more people that can do wonderful work like that. Imagination with adults, very powerful. The brain does know the difference. It really does not know the difference. And it's a skill we can develop. And I said, and then awareness is the ultimate. And you know, awareness for me, it's not a state of mind, it's an action. Everything is action based for me, everything is movement based. And awareness is something we do, it's a skill we develop. And when we bring awareness to our own process and to the changes that happens, and or we bring awareness to the changes in the other person, it has an enormous, I, I call it awareness is the glue of the brain. Rather than doing a hundred repetitions, become really aware and it's yours. You can really save a lot of time. How much time have I got left? That's all, I'm gonna skip that, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, I'm gonna ask Dr. Melillo. Uh, Set camp, if the talk Melillo is not here. What's number nine? Awareness. Awareness. Oh, I have gifts for you. You're gonna get the list, don't worry. I just remembered I have gifts for you. Uh, I, can I steal an extra four minutes, Dr. Melillo? Uh, sure. Sure. I want to show you a video, and then I'm gonna tell you just very briefly about some products, but uh, show you a video, uh, Cypress. Cypress. Just him or you want Amy and him? Amy, forget Amy, it's uh, to, to, no, okay, put Amy to the mother. It's very important, actually, but, but Neil was the first one to give him the first lesson. The kid, you'll see, was devastated. You'll see a, a, a progression, uh, he had the basal ganglia damage, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the, over a period of uh, two and a half years, right? Or three, something like yeah, that. Right. So you get, so just know it took two and a half years. It didn't happen in four minutes, okay? When you watch it, it's not. And we, yeah, we first started seeing him at nine months and the mother had just been told that he will never walk or talk. Yeah, he, he, he doesn't stop talking. <laughs> It was at the book, book, uh, book party for, for Kids Beyond Limits. And we have also Dr. Merzenich talking about, we don't have time to show that, so. I want to tell you about my son, Cyprus. The In July of 2008, after a traumatic birth, I met my son, who would become my personal superhero. Cyprus didn't have a heartbeat when he was born. After two rounds of resuscitation, he came to life. On the sixth day of his life, he had an MRI showing brain damage in the basal ganglia and received the prognosis of highly probable cerebral palsy. I was devastated. I had little understanding of what that meant and how it might affect our lives. We were told to go home, wait, and watch, and to see if he missed milestones. We took him home and just loved him. At three months, we were told he should be doing more, and he started traditional physical therapy. For the next six months, we saw little change. When Cyprus was nine months old, we connected with the Anatpa Neil method. Neil Sharp gave him his first lesson, in which he rolled over for the first time. I knew we'd found our path. I'm going to try to get through this without crying, but there's no promises. <laughs> That's a very good crying for Short <laughs> Shortly after we met with Anat, she looked me in the eyes and recognized my fear and said, everything is going to be okay. And I knew instinctively to trust her. We let go of traditional therapy and watched Cypress progress. He started rolling to get around, then commando crawling, and then onto hands and knees and at 19 months, he was pulling to standing. At that time, we were told by our neurologist that in the future, we would be looking for a wheelchair because there was no way he was ever gonna walk. The next day, Neil taught him how to crawl upstairs. I remember saying that going to, the, to see the neurologist is like visiting the Office of Limitations, and I would rather come here to the center for, for possibilities. Three weeks ago, 
Cypress started walking. <laughs> I should also mention he rarely stops talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there's some footage of Cypress that's going to be shown. But you're so hot that I melted I fell right through the cracks Now I'm trying to get back Before the cool done run out I'll be giving it my best This and nothing's gonna stop me But divine intervention I reckon it's again my turn To win some or learn some But I won't hey, So I'll take no more No more It Cannot wait. I'm yours. Very, very gentle. Much more gradually. Mm -hmm. Just softer, okay? Yeah. Well, open up your mind and see like me. Open up your plans and damn, you're free. I look into your heart and you'll find love, love, love. Listen to the music of the moment people dance and sing We're just one big family And it's our God forsaken right to be loved Love, 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 love So I won't take So I'll take no more No more It cannot wait I'm sure there's no need Time is short, this is our fate. I'm yours. Do you do 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 Checking my tongue in the mirror And bending over backwards just to try to see it clearer But my breath fogged up the glass And so I drew a new face and I laughed I guess what I'll be saying is There ain't no better reason To rid yourself of vanities and just go with the seasons It's what we aim to do Our name is our virtue But I won't hesitate no more, no more, it cannot wait. I'm yours. Well, open up your mind and see like me. Open up your plans and damn you're free. I look at the sky. Oh, you got it, honey. They're You gonna jump? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, beautiful. I can't get enough of this, especially with a song. <laughs> but so what I, I wanted to show to you, there's nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it's not, it's, it's going to be a butterfly. And that is the basis of this work. And for me, it's, it's not the, the whole universe, but I feel that it's a very, very powerful aspect when we get the brain what it needs. And we, a lot of how to do it is counterproductive. So the first thing, I'm not counterproductive, counterintuitive. 
reducing force, slowing down, all the things that we were raised to believe that are not how we get our goals accomplished. So anyone who's interested in the second room? Uh, booth number 38. What? Booth number 38? OK, there, there's a, you can take a free poster with the nine essentials if you want to have it in your office or in your, on your refrigerator or under your bed or anywhere. And uh, we have a list of links, uh, conversations with Jill Balti taylor um, a, Anyway, all kinds of stuff and articles videos, as well and articles, videos. and so on. Of course, you will get a copy of this uh, thing. And then uh, I, I know Mike Setkamp, Dr. Setkamp, wants me to mention that we teach professional training programs. We train practitioners. It's a phenomenal uh, uh, process. I tell people, if you do not want to really change, don't come because most of the big part of the work is done through your own experience, lots of movement lessons, lot, and a major, major progression. And you can hear details, there's a full catalog or a card. And then there are, I won't show it to you, I'm running late, but there are a couple books and there are videos if you're interested, um, you're welcome to get those. And I really want to thank you for the opportunity to present to you because I know all of you are bringing an enormous amount of value and, uh, to people and a lot of change and help. So thank you very much. <laughs>